Welcome everybody, great to see, see you all attending from different parts of New South Wales. So welcome to the July Soils Network of Knowledge webinar. Okay, now I'd like to introduce, and I'll say it properly, Jaw Wen. Hope I got that right. <laughs> but I'll refer to, to Jaw as Han, as he's more commonly known in Australia, uh, who's presenting today's webinar. And the webinar is What Happens to Carbon in the Soil After Biochar is Applied? Han is a third year UNE PhD student of Lucas Van Sweeten, Dr. Lucas Van Sweeten up at Wallingbar Primary Industries Institute. And his thesis topic is biochar stability and its role in native soil carbon and root derived carbon stabilisation with field and laboratory investigations into those mechanisms. Han graduated from the University of East Anglia in Norwich in the United Kingdom with a BSc honours degree in environmental sciences. But much more excitingly, Han received the prize for the best presentation by an under 35 year old for this year's, uh, last year's National Soil, Con Soil Science Conference held in Melbourne in November last year. Thank you, Luke. But Stu, thank you for attending today's webinar. So today we talk about what happened to soil carbon after biochar is applied in a research aspect. For those of you not familiar with biochar, I'll give you a quick introduction. Biochar is a carbon-rich product which derives from thermal desorption of literally any organic matter in a carbon low environment. It looks like charcoal here, as you can see, but it's different. So the main difference is how we produce it. As I said before, it's been produced in a no oxygen environment. And also it can be made of literally any material. So what biochar for then? Why use biochar? Biochar can use as a soil amendment. If you want to improve your soil fertility, this has been many literature show biochar has the ability to improve crop yield, increase water holding capacity. Biochar can be also used as an approach for waste management. For instance, the waste water management, biochar can use as a solvent. Also, biochar is kind of a byproduct from biofuel generations. And most recently, there's a lot of interest in use biochar as a carbon sequestration approach, which I will tell you more about today. Another term we're going to use very often today is called the priming effect. So what is priming effect? Priming effect is defined as the change in the turnover rates of soil at organic carbon after you apply some substrates. In this case, we talk about carbon, but not necessarily. Sometimes nitrogen can also introduce priming. But today, we focus on the carbon priming. So how priming works? As you can see in this diagram underneath the text, this in white bar is the soil organic carbon. Once you put carbon substrate, if the soil organic carbon doesn't change, it's no priming. If after you apply the substrate, there's an increase in soil organic carbon turnover, so you have more CO2 emissions. This is a positive priming. Vice versa, if there's a decrease in soil organic carbon turnover, this is a negative priming. So over the past decades, there are thousands of literature based on biochar applications. Many of them focus on the stability or the longevity of biochar. However, many of the study has been conducted in a laboratory environment. Very few study was done in the field, which is where we're going to apply the biochar. And none of them have a focus on the biochar plants or biochar root interactions, as you can see in this picture here. So, to measure is to know. We set up two field trials at Warden Bar DPI to assess first how stable is fresh biochar in the field in a ferrosol and a subtropical climate, which also being used as an annual ryegrass pasture. 
and how biochar interact with soil organic carbon and plant-derived carbon. Secondly, we're interested in how biochar interaction with soil carbons can change over time. As you can see, this famous picture here is Terracretus australis, which created by centuries ago by the Australian Aborigines. So to start, we set up our first trial. And top picture shows that's a snapshot of our water about DPI, nice and green here. And we measure the soil respirations. Also, for the first time, we introduce a soil plus root respiration chambers from which we can study the biochar plants interactions. And we also use a stable isotope techniques to quantify the root respirations, which I'm going to get, show you more details in a minute. And this all the methodologies and the results was documented in our latest paper, which recently accepted by soil biology and biochemistry. Hopefully will come online very soon. So let me tell you more about stable isotope techniques, which help you to understand how we get our results. Like everybody have a driving license, in the nature, there's a driving license for all the elements, which this driving license is given in terms of the carbon-13 signatures. Each element, such as air, biochar, and soil, have their own identical signatures, which differ from each other. As you can see in this diagram here, they are all very different, which give us an opportunity to separate each sources. So we use an alkaline trap in this respiration chamber here, from which we can capture the total CO2 emissions in the traps. Then we can determine the, the total carbon-13 signatures. And use the mathematical equations, we can separate the biochar carbon mineralization and soil mineralizations in this two-pool system. So I'm not going to show the equation here, just, you know, that's early start. That's too much for, for a morning. So if you want to know more, please find our paper. So unlike the two-pool systems, where you only have soils and biochar, a planting system has never been public, pub, published in the literature. The reason because the three pool systems have the plant, the soil, and the biochar, which interact with each other, can change the soil, the total emissions, and it's very hard to quantify. For this, we introduce a novel root plus soil respiration chambers, where you can see in the middle is exactly like the soil respiration chamber I showed you before. But on the side, we have a so-called root growth chamber from which the plant is grown and the roots can grow through the root windows, which on the column here, inside into the chamber, within which we can measure the soil plus biochar plus plant's respiration. Just to quickly show you, this is a snapshot taken inside of the chamber shortly after harvest. As you can see, there's some white, very fine living roots onto the surface. And use another mathematic equations, we can quantify the root respiration chain. And as you can see here, there's a three different signature. So for the post labeling, we introduce a carbon 13 in rich environment, which gave us a higher root, root signal from minus 25 to 150. So we can quantify the root respiration in here. As you can see, the voucher had no impact on respiration. So will plants have the impact on voucher carbon mineralization then? Again, we show plants actually did not change the biochar mineralization. As you can see, the difference is within the margin of error. And we use a model to estimate the mean residence time of biochar 
in our particular system, which will qualify, which is estimated to be around 449 to 483 years in the planted or unplanted system. Again, this is, this is within the error, which means there's no difference. So you might ask, what is different? Why you talk to me something not different? Now here, as I described before, the priming effects, which shows actually in the planted system, when the plants can interact with biochar, there is a decrease in soil organic carbon turnover. So there will be less CO2 em emitted from biochar planted system compared to not unamended soils, as you can see here. In most literature, the time scale of the studies only is about three months to half year. So in that short period, you can see there's a plus peak here, which means there's increase of the turnover of soil organic matter. However, over time, it's a decrease. The, mo the reason it's exciting is because the most studies don't include plants, which as you can see overall is around zero. There's no priming, there's no change. But in the real world where the planted is, in a practical system, we show actually this biochar can reduce the mineralization of soil organic carbon. And now we wonder what happened for this very impressive results can change over time. Whether the biochar still can reduce the soil organic carbon loss or not. So we go back to visit an ex existing trial which was set up in 2006 by Lucas van Sweden and Steve Kimba, where they put two types of biochar into the solar system. One is beef lot manure biochar, another one is grain waste harbu biochar. And they found there's a very rapid increase in soil organic carbon shortly after 36 months. And the most impressive increase was delivered by a hardwood biochar. Back then it's called grain waste biochar. And we wonder what happened to this particular treatment in to, in after nine years aging in the field. So I was very fortunate to, off, to be offered opportunity to step back to this historical site and use the very similar setup as I showed you previously. So we look at four treatments in this site. The first one is unamended soils. We call it control. Secondly, look at nine-year age biochar, which was applied 10 ton per hectare, roughly 1% to the top 100 mil soil depths. And also we applied the exactly same biochar at the same dose in the top 10 centimeters. And also we wonder what happened if we apply fresh biochar to the existing aged biochar plots. For instance, our farmers want to increase their yield, but find their biochar slowly redu reduce kind of the effect. So he's thinking about doing a second application. So that's what this last treatment about, a secondary application of biochar. Again, this is our old friend. And in this case, you can see this biochar signature is very similar to the plants. So to avoid this, we use the post labeling to enrich the root signal again, from which we can quantify the root respirations. As you can see the foot treatment here, the control, the fresh biochar, the aged biochar, and the second, the second application. Again, biochar treatment had no impact on root respiration. But interestingly, we find the fuel age biochar can reduce soil organic carbon turnover rate, so-called the negative priming. This time, both the planted and unplanted system show the same effect. Biochar slow down the soil organic carbon loss. This might explain why we still observe 
a further increase in the age bar chart plots even after nine years. Again, in the second application, we will apply fresh chart into age chart plot. You, you have a cumulative increase. It's very rapid shortly after four months. And the black line here shows the calculate total soil carbon, which equals to the soil carbons plus the biochar additional carbons. And we find there actually there's a margin here. The green here shows is the actual measurement of the total soil. And this might partially be explained by the negative priming we observed earlier. So, just bear with me. To conclude, we show that biochar did not impact root respiration. And as we round, the rules did not change biochar degrade, degradation rates either. And this particular hardwood biochar in our study system induced a significant negative priming on soil organic carbon. So it reduced the soil organic carbon loss. And such negative priming may account for the increase in total carbon even after eight years. So in, in established trial, Lucas and Steve show there's a rapid increase in total soil carbon after biochar application. And we show if you add more chars in the existing biochar plots, there's a further increase in so, total soil carbon. And we're wondering what happened if you adding more chars into the soil, whether there's like a limitation whether there is a capacity to holding more carbon in this pasture system. So I'd like to thank these very important people for their emotional and technical support. Without them, all I can show today is just some titles and some beautiful pictures. So thank you for your attention. Back to Luke. Well, thank you very much, much Han. That was very interesting. I have. Hey, Peter Entwistle here. My, my question was oh, the, the rates of yes. biochar that were used in the original trial that Lucas put down. Yep, it's 10 ton per hectare into the top 10 centimetres soil. So it's equivalent to about 1%. Okay. Yeah, in, so when we do the, the, our new the trial on top of the old trials, we use exact, exactly the same dose. Tantum per hectare yeah. too, and also the same biochar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got a question from Eddie Joshua. Hello, Han. I'm just wondering if there is an ability to change commercial compost production systems into a biochar production system so that when people are composting green waste, Yes. We could actually mm -hmm. make it into biochar and spread that instead. Yes, there, there's been many literature based on the use combining compost with char as well. And also, of course, there is a way to actually convert compost system into a char system. But I'm no expert in engineering, but I know a lot of people who do, like uh, Stephen Joseph or Luke Van Sweden or Steve Kimber. And there, there's a way to do this. It really depends on whether it's kind of eco economic, or, and also you know in terms of energy bills and uh, what what do you really want to use biochar for? Because um, it's biochar can make of any organic matter as I mentioned before. So and also when you apply biochar, you have to tailor biochar for specific purposes. Like if you want to use biochar for its uh, fert fertilizer kind of ability, you have to use probably something like a manure or high ash content jars. For composting, I think char can reduce the emissions to start, but it's it depends on the water how, the water content of your compost too. So I think it's possible, but I, I no, no expert in this area, so I think you need to ask some, some kind of specialist, but there is definitely a way, Eddie. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, Helen Wheeler. So here's Helen's question, Han. Um, for the yes. graph, for the graph shown, fresh biochar plus fertilizer. Yep. Aged biochar plus fertilizer, then fresh plus aged biochar. Was the yep. And Helen's question is, was the total amount yep. applied larger than the fresh plus aged than the individual fresh or aged? Yes, uh, the fresh plus aged char is 20 tempactor. It is large. It's not compared with the uh, single dose. It just look at the second applications. So the fresh and aged chars, they all 10 tempactor. The fresh plus age is the 10 ton per hectare of fresh chars applied in the existing 10 ton per hectare biochar in the field. So it makes a 20 ton per hectare. It is larger. That's why the black calculate line is much taller than this two line here. Thank you, Harold. This, this graph is loads of information. So I just pinpoint some very interesting findings and just try to not to confuse you. But thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify this graph. So thanks for that, Helen. Ian Packer has asked a question. How are you going? Um, just got feelings about the use of biochar in your drier climates and your porous soils like your red brown earths and things like that. Yep. Um, and the it's, economics of yep. it all. Yeah. I know we haven't right, got any okay. data. Yeah. Yep. Economics. So we start with the dry. It's actually this is a subtropical climate. It's we call it a very guaranteed rainfall every year. It's not really a dry environment. It's a bit warm and it's it's humid. So it's not dry. And for economics, we haven't I haven't done any economics on this particular trial yet. So but there is some uh, life cycle analysis done by Annette Cowie and and also in in existing trial we found this actually the how biochar did not increase the uh, the crop yield if you want to know something to do with the econ economics but as I'm also said there's a, a manual biochar which significantly increased the crop yield because it changed the phosphate availability so but it's not sta it's not that stable as the how charts it's really come back to the point what do you want to use char for? Whether you want to have a short and increase in yield, or you really kind of thinking the carbon budget to use as a trading kind of a mechanism. But another a new way is like combine the two chars, or there also are enhanced biochar, which is clay coated chars on the manure or urea. So which it's kind of a slow release kind of biochar if you like, which can mm. somehow make it more cost effective if you like. But thank you for the questions. All right. And just to clarify, Han, um, I, I think what Ian was saying that in areas okay. like ours that are drier, uh, how does it apply? Yeah. yeah. Is that right, Ian? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. It, we, we probably won't get the same same reaction in yeah, the drier climate. Right. Yeah. It's 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 very different. Uh, like there are also a trial. We're also involving uh, national wide trials, which I've also down in this one down in Tasmania on the same similar soil as ferrosol as well which the climate is totally different it's cold and but it's a bit wet too so but it's it's really kind of system specific if it's really dry in our, in our during our experiment actually we also find if during the dry season the kind of mineralization will slow down overall because you don't have water for the plants also there's no not much kind of interaction from the bugs as well in the soil. So actually it's kind of, it's more, it's more likely to slow down. But also because this is a clay soil, what, what we use. If you're talking about sandy soil and those not very fertile soil, and this most likely biochar may not work as a charm as we did in our specific system. So again, you have to tailor the char to meet your need. Great, and th uh, thanks to Steve Kimber. I've unmuted you, Steve, if you've got a phone. Just getting back to Ian Packer's question, I don't think the sort of rates we're putting here on the coast would be applicable to your, to your um, Western systems. Uh, and Han alluded to the Western Australian work where they were, they're actually banding at planting using using much lower rates. Might even be in the just in the hundreds of kilos per hectare. 
um, because the cost of the biochar is quite significant. Um, but if you're doing that sort of application year after year with the type of um, residence times that Han's talking about, you're going to build up your soil carbon in any case. Uh, but I wanted to make a comment originally that, that this study is in a um, permanent pasture system and it would be interesting to look at a cultivated system and see whether you're still going to get that, that same sort of uh, accumulation of carbon or whether that oxidative effect of turning your, your soil over regularly is going to um, going to reverse that process. Great, Thank you, Steve. Steve. Thank you. And I'll thank you very much for a very informative, um, very informative webinar. And uh, yeah, thanks for everybody for attending and especially to you, Han, for um, such a great presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Luke. I appreciate the time and effort. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone. Thanks. We'll end it there.